Kia ora, welcome to this Goodfellow Unit webinar on managing the first aid dental and other common oral conditions. This webinar is kindly supported by Mercy Ascot today. So to introduce our speaker, it's Dr. Moama Abu Saria, who's an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. He also works in reconstructive and head and neck surgery, and he works at Auckland Head and Neck Hospital at Mercy Hospital. Welcome, Moana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I am very grateful to all of you uh, for giving the time um, to sit with me this evening and listen. And I hope really at the end of my talks, uh, you will uh, learn something um, which you will find relevant and helpful. Um, it's actually my first time to give a webinar presentation. I find it very interesting because um, there is no really facing audience involved and as a result the physical or the potential physical confrontation is completely eliminated. <laughs> <laughs> so please um, make yourself comfortable. Um, there's a lot of things to cover and I will start my talk. Uh, the first talk is about first aid or oral surgery aid um, for primary care. I have no conflict of interest to declare. I will start by giving a bit of background about Auckland Head and Neck Specialist, and then we will um, list common um, dental and oral surgery uh, emergencies. I will outline the role of the GP uh, in assessing these conditions and, um, and familiarize them with the pathway of referral. And I hope at the end of the evening, you will feel comfortable and confident uh, in examining the oral cavity and assessing various conditions. Auckland Head and Neck is a private service that uh, provides wide range of services, uh, including head and neck cancer with complex free flap surgery, uh, salivary glands, skin cancer, thyroid, facial deformity, TMJ surgery, and implants, tooth extraction, and facial fractures. Our strength relies on team approach. We work as a multidisciplinary team, and this is um, to follow international standards and also uh, the New Zealand standards of, of uh, looking at uh, clinical problems um, from different perspectives. We have an ICU, we have head and neck ward. We work very closely with the friends and colleagues from radiology and pathology. We also have medical and radiation oncologists, swallow specialists, oral rehabilitation, rehabilitation specialists, cancer nurse specialists, and dietitians to support our service. Here are the small uh, or four individuals who are the, represent the surgical part of our service. I am one of the four, I have uh, my colleague uh, Rajan Patel on the left, um, Mark Izzard and Kevin Smith. They are all head and neck surgeon from ENT background. I came to head and neck surgery from maxillofacial surgery background and I'm dentally qualified. And that's how I ended up by talking about dental um, and oral surgery emergencies. We will start with tooth abscess. All of us, I'm sure, encountered or examined or assist patients with present coming to your rooms or your practice with tooth abscess. They are not, I don't like to view them as a, a simple tooth abscess because they can uh, have um, serious complications. In general, this diagram represents, and I am using the cursor as a pointer, the upper teeth uh, pathway of, of spread of infection. You can have the maxillary sinus, the nose, the palate, but also the infection can track laterally over the vaccinator muscle to affect the cheek or medial to the vaccinator muscle to be just as a localized infection inside the mouth. Generally speaking, infections related to upper teeth are not really life-threatening. The worst case scenario will be really cavernous sinus thrombosis and possible uh, death 
and this is extremely rare. While the lower teeth are more troublesome because they can spread to the neck and floor the mouth compromising the airway. So patient will present with uh, throbbing pain, initially localized, the patient will come and tell you this tooth is really hurting me. Uh, they will be sleep deprived and they can present, as I said, with intraoral or extraoral, a combination of extraoral and intraoral swelling. They may have systemic upset, which we'll talk about. So that it is a spectrum of a localized infection to cervicofacial infection. This is a picture of a localized infection related to one of the maxillary teeth. While these are infection related to involving the buccal space with erythema spreading to the submedular region and upper chest. This gentleman on the left-hand side, you can see that the infection also extending to the submandibular submental space all the way from the cheek. These patients, uh, the, they have Ludwig angina or involvement of the submandibular sublingual spaces and they are very unwell. And you can see them that they are both intubated. This gentleman was treated in Manchester when I was in the UK, uh, had an infection from his teeth, it tracked down to his pericardium and caused collection in the pericardium, which was uh, drained using interventional radiology. So the red flag signs are listed here. So any patient comes with a progressive swelling, difficulty in breathing, uh, a raised tongue, a drooling saliva, changing the voice, all of these are listed in the table Please, these are the red flag signs that there's something seriously going on. And this flow chart hopefully will help you to assess these patients. So if it's a facial swelling, the most common cause in about 70 to 80% would be dental cause. If it's a dental cause, you need yes. So is there any red flag signs? If it's yes, you need to consider IV antibiotics and refer the patient urgently to the nearest uh, local service, maxillofacial service. If no red flag signs, you can give actually the patient IV antibiotics and send them to their uh, dentist within 24 hours if possible. If there is, or bring the patient back and see them the next day. If there is improvement, send them to the dentist. If there's no improvement and or getting worse, they need to be seen in a hospital setting. If the cause is not dentally related, you need to address these non-odontogenic causes. So the take home message here, tooth abscess can be life threatening. Look for red flag signs and don't delay antibiotics and analgesia and keep the patient nil by mouth and consider hospital referral. They can be really serious. Moving on to the second dental emergency or first aid dental trauma. They, are, they usually present in toddlers or patients who have a young young teen uh, patients who have ugly duckling stage, which is really a description of uh, fanning or protrusion of the teeth. They are easily uh, exposed and they can be knocked out. They present with either pain or bleeding or chipped tooth or a missing tooth. The management as any trauma patient, look at the ABC and make sure that there is no undergoing non-accidental uh, injury Examine the patient with good light, good suction, and good look. Give antibiotics and keep them nil by mouth, just in case if you decided to refer the patient to the hospital. This is an avulsed central incisor coming out of the socket. So if it's an avulsed tooth, patient will come to you, obviously, you see there's a missing tooth. Usually the parents are distressed and, and anxious. You need to assess, is it, um, from the patient age, is this a milk tooth, baby tooth, or is it an adult tooth? Um, and how many teeth are missing? And where is the tooth or the teeth are missing? Um, and it, sometimes you can get an elderly patient with very mobile, loose teeth, one of them is knocked out. Um, it is important to know whether there's also gum disease or not. These are pictures how to reposition a tooth. Um, Basically, you clean the area, give the patient anesthetic, um, clean the tooth, 
and repositioning the tooth in place. If you don't have a splint to splint it, I mean, um, we will talk about this. You can use tin foil or the packaging of the suturing material. So first aid of an avulsed tooth, if the tooth is present, attempt to reposition it if possible or refer the patient to the dentist. Store the patient in uh, the, not the patient, sorry, store the tooth in milk. <laughs> um, and if the tooth is missing, consider a chest X-ray uh, and refer to a dentist within 24 hours. Mobile or subluxated teeth or chipped teeth. They are usually, you can see this here, the tooth sticks out of the socket a little bit. The gum around the neck of the tooth is a bit erythematous and sometimes it will bleed. The tooth is tender. This is obviously a chipped tooth. Again, assess ABC, rule out non-accidental injury, give antibiotics and keep the patient nil by mouth. If ask where is the chipped fragment, is it in the chest? Is it with the patient? And don't throw it away because the dentist can use it to rebuild the tooth. Give the patient strictly advice to adhere to puree diet or soft diet, nothing to chew, and send the patient to their dentist for a splint and further treatment. If there is no dentist, to the local maxillofacial surgery service. So in general, dental trauma, think about ABC, rule out non-accidental injury, give antibiotics, and refer the patient. Facial trauma. It can range from a simple facial laceration or a compound laceration that involves the bone as well. This gentleman um, had a glass almost de uh, is virtually degloving most of his nose. And I am hoping that you will not see this patient coming to your practice, because this means that there is a, it's not only something wrong with the patient, but probably with the people who brought him to your practice. So this needs debridement and closure within 24 hours because there will be a risk of infection. The face uh, laceration usually heals very fast. So you need to send the patient to get these cleaned and debrided within 24 hours. There is also a risk of facial tattooing. Um, and I mean that if the patient uh, will fill on a ground or dirty surface, they will get uh, dirt um, uh, um, embedded in the skin, it would be really very hard to get rid of it. So it needs good cleaning sometime, most of the time under general aesthetic. Puncture wounds need exploring and think about dog bites or human bites and non-accidental injury again. So this is the patient before, obviously, and this is after uh, debridement and closure. So facial laceration, think of A, B, C again, give antibiotics, risk of infection, uh, a plywood goes over the wound. If it's small and you are confident and simple, there's no bone involvement, you can close it with, if it's the skin surface, 5 or 4 or nylon. If it's inside the mouth or the gum or the lip, you can use Vicryl. Uh, I refer urgently to the maxillofacial surgeon if the laceration is compound or complex. Fractured jaw. This is a clinical photograph and clearly shows a stiff deformity. You can see the uh, line of the lower occlusal line is really uh, not even. You have sublingual hematoma here. You have laceration there. Uh, there's clearly, uh, there's a fracture of the mandible. Mandibular fractures are largely due to a punch uh, to the face due to interpersonal violence, while maxillary and mid-face fractures are usually due to high energy or high velocity impact. A patient will present with a swelling uh, of the mouth, maybe the occlusion is wrong, um, pain, and they also will tell you that I feel that every time I chew or move my jaw, there's something rubbing, bone rubbing, piece of bone rubbing each other. So A, B, C again, uh, rule out head injury, keep nil by mouth, give antibiotics and analgesia, and refer the patient to maxillofacial surgery service immediately. Cheekbone fracture, or also called malar bone fracture, or the most fancy scientific description of that is zygomatico orbital complex fracture, is also very common. This gentleman has a classical circumorbital ecchymosis or hematoma, which is a bit old because you can see it's becoming a bit yellow. 
he has a flattening flattening of the right cheek. Uh, it's very obvious. And if you see them acutely, you will see there's a unilateral epi epistaxis or bleeding from inside, from the nose on the right-hand side. This is bird eye view showing a flattening of the cheekbone compared to the left-hand side. You, can, you will also get subconjunctival hemorrhage, which is really fresh a bleeding point of the uh, sclera of the eye, affected eye. And if you ask the patient to look up, you will not be able to see the posterior limit of that because it tracks all the way down to the floor of the orbit. This is a 3D reconstruction showing fractures, zygomatical orbital complex fracture. So the signs, I will usually see the left-hand side because most people are right-handed. Uh, they present with circumorbital ecomosis, but it is not a hard sign. The subconjunctival hemorrhage, the unilateral epistaxis, and flat cheek, they are really very hard signs. So if you have a patient with these three ones in the red, your likelihood to have significant fracture of the orbit or the gygoma is, is high. They will also present with numbness of the cheek and restricted mouth opening and possibly diplopia, most of the time due to soft tissue edema. The numbness is due to the crushing of the infraorbital nerve, which supply this area of the face, the cheek, side of the nose, and upper lip. So for cheekbone fracture, again, ABC, rule out head injury, assist the eye, please, and no need for antibiotics because it's not really exposed to the external environment or to the mouth. I refer to maxillofacial surgery service when the swellings in within about three to five days, because most of these cases will not be treated acutely to allow the swelling to settle down. But don't delay it again because of the delays in public system. These patients really need to be treated within two weeks uh, maximum before the fracture start to heal in the wrong place. Trapdoor orbital fracture. This is very uncommon, but the reason why I listed this because really it's important due to its, its impact on, 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 on the patient population. This is young child, and you can see he's quite distressed. He's unhappy to open his eyes in the, in the bright light. His right eye is restricted and cannot move upwards compared to the left eye. And the reason for that is it's usually blunt trauma. If you have like a, a tennis ball hitting the eye, the eye will bounce back, and then the energy will transfer, be transferred to the weakest point of the orbit, which is usually the floor. And as a result, in young patients, the bone is very elastic and, and plastic, so it will bend down, crack, and then snap back, and it bounce back to its place, the trapping periorbital fat and sometime the inferior rectus muscle, as you can see here. So there is a difference between a trap door in a child where you will have almost no defect in the floor of the orbit, but there's a lot of tissue because that flicks down, tissue herniated, and then the bone flicks back again compared to the typical adult orbital blowout when you have a defect in the floor of the orbit. Because of the trapment, these patients, they will have oculocardiac reflex and this is presented by nausea and vomiting and most of the hospital they will think this is part of the head injury which results in the delay of patient transfer because the patient will be staying for 24 hour head injury observation when actually it is if they do a ct scan they see the fracture it is very clear that it's really a trap the, the reason for the nausea and vomiting due to the trapment of the um, extra ocular uh, soft tissue um, rather than head injury. So the patient will be, they are usually children, uh, painful eye, restricted movement, nausea and vomiting, uh, photosensitivity and double vision. And because of the delay in the hospital, they usually present too late. These patients, you need to operate on them within eight hours. Otherwise, 70% of them will have permanent ocular dysmotility squint uh, and they will need complex uh, oculoplastic operations afterwards. So take home message for facial trauma, ABC, if it's fractured mandible, compounded fractures or dirty complex lacerations, please keep the patient nil by mouth, give antibiotics, uh, and you need to refer the patient to the local maxillofacial service within 24 hours. If a trap door fracture, as I explained, you need to, there is no need to give antibiotics. 
uh, but keep the patient nil by mark because these patients they need to go to theater within eight hours to uh, release the, the, the periorbital tissue. For cheekbone fracture, no need for antibiotics, as I mentioned. Common problems as well, you encounter your practice bleeding to socket. And all what you really need to do here is it's normal to have blood stain saliva in the first 24 hours after removing a tooth. But if it's really unusual, it is a venous ooze. So ask if the patient's on anticoagulants, get good light, good suction, and look. Apply pressure in a, a piece of uh, gauze for about 10 minutes. And most of the time, it will the bleeding will stop. You can give um, tranexamic acid mouthwash and ask the patient to stick with cold, lukewarm, uh, pure diet for 24 to 48 hours afterwards. There is no usually, most of the time, you don't need to stop the anticoagulants. And if obviously it continues, refer the patient to the person who took the tooth out. So bleeding two sockets, usually stop by applying pressure. Uh, you don't need to stop the anticoagulants as I mentioned, um, but it can also be part of the hypocoagulopathic bleeding disorder systemic. And this is an example of a patient who had von Willebrand uh, disease. This is typical of a dry socket, usually failure of the clot to form. You have the bone being exposed. If you put your finger, pass it across the buccal or palatal aspect, the patient will jump. He won't like it. Um, it's usually at day three to five after extraction. It's very common in smokers. And there's no clot, as I mentioned. Uh, and sometimes you feel the neck, you will find ipsilateral cervical lymphoadenopathy. These patients, I will give them the whole lot really because they are in agony, they can't sleep, they are miserable. So just give them Augmentin uh, 6 to 5. If they are allergic, give them Clindamycin 300 milligrams QDS. Give them really Paracetamol, Ibuprofen, and Tramadol, all of them, the three analgesics. Otherwise, it will, it will make li their life really easy and give them a chlorhexidine mouthwash as well. Advise them to stop smoking uh, and and I refer the patient to the dentist who, who carried out the extraction. Acute closed mouth lock. This is again a common problem. You encounter a patient coming to you saying that they can't open their mouth fully. It's usually young women. Um, I will skip to the next slide, which is uh, a hand-drawn slide. You can see it is very professional. <laughs> so you have the, uh, this is the TMG uh, joint, consists of articulation between the condyle of the mandible and the glenoid fossa or the mandibular fossa. You have the articular disc or a cartilage that sits on the top of the head or the condyle of the mandible. If this starts to slip, usually ideally these, the head and the cartilage should move backward and forward smoothly together all the time. If this, this relationship gets disrupted and the um, cartilage start to slip, usually to the front, the patient will start developing click. If this slips completely and permanently in the front and doesn't go back, it will cause uh, acute lock of the mouth. So every time the patient would like to open the mouth, they feel there's some, something blocking them from opening the mouth fully. So the patient will come to you and say, I can't open my mouth fully. It is becoming now painful. I used to click before, but now it stopped. And this is a, a, a bad sign. This means that there is a non-reducible anterior disc or cartilage displacement. Give these patients non-steroidal anti-inflammatory on full stomach for two weeks. Uh, you can use cold or heat applications, massage, soft diet, nothing chewy, no chewing gum, no candies. If they, if they clench, ask them to try to avoid that if possible. You can give them bite splint uh, via their dentist. Um, if no improvement, refer to uh, local maxillofacial surgery. And there's evidence to support that in acute um, closed lock of the mouth, 
joint washout or arthrosynthesis with infiltration of the TMG joint with plated rich plasma or and hyaluronic acid acid is effective. So acute closed mouth lock, uh, loss of clicking. Patients, they will say, I used to click, but now I stop. Restricted mouth opening and it's painful. So it's most likely to be uh, anterior disc displacement and think of arthrosynthesis. TMJ dislocation, and again, if the in this case, if the the actual condyle of the mandible slip beyond the articular eminence here, you will get dislocation, and that can be unilateral or bilateral. In the unilateral dislocation, you will have the chin point deviated to the contralateral side, and the mouth is locked in in an open position. The patient can't close, and this is called open lock. It's unlike the closed lock, this is an open lock. While on the right-hand side, you can see that the chin point is in the midline, the, the patient cannot close the mouth, and this is bilateral TMJ dislocation. And if you feel carefully in front of the ear, you'll feel that there's an empty joint space. It's a kind of a depression. There's no condyle. You can't feel a condyle there. The way to reposition that, you need to be really honest with the patient. It's going to be a bit uncomfortable. You can give a bit of sedation, but watch. Usually a fixed elderly, if you give sedation to the elderly, you will probably struggle to get them out of your practice uh, uh, for probably for several hours. So you need to stand in front of them, you sit them on the chair and basically push downward with your thumbs and rotate upward with the remaining fingers in an anti-clockwise direction and disengage the condyle from here. So you are pushing down you disengage the condyle to go up over this hump, the articular eminence, and then slide it gradually upward to go into the fossa and hold it there. So usually I think elderly can be unilateral or bilateral, and I, I describe the, how, how to tell. Um, and the longer you leave it, it becomes really hard to reduce. Give analgesia, consider sedation. Be honest, that is going to be uncomfortable for a few seconds, but then after that, the patient will feel better and go home. Bandage usually doesn't really help avoid any kind of stick with soft diet for the next three days or so. Uh, avoid mouth opening and it probably, I find it very useful really to teach a member of the family how to reposition that, especially if it happens again. Uh, and if it recurs again, refer to local service, maxillofacial surgery service. One of the uh, topics which I've been asked really to cover, which is really not really related to an emergency. I can't see any patient coming to you asking, <laughs> I lost my dental floss between my teeth and it's an emergency. But clearly there's a demand of, of, of learning about the value of dental flossing. Um, this picture basically illustrates that most of the plaque, this is basically a patient being uh, asked to brush teeth and then they asked to rinse the mouth with disclosing agent to see how effective their brushing technique was. And you can see actually most of the stain is in the interproximal space, which is the space which accumulates plaque and bacteria. Um, when it, there are two issues here. If we are talking about dental decay, there's conflicting evidence that actually dental flossing will reduce risk of interproximal decay. But if it comes to periodontal disease or gum disease, there's evidence to support that actually flossing will help to reduce risk of periodontal disease. So you are unlikely to have mobile teeth, unlikely to lose your teeth. So I would, my advice to you, the message to the patients do, to carry on using dental flossing, especially the ones which are really impregnated with the fluoride. Um, and if anything will come good out of it, at least they will not have gum disease and periodontal disease and they will not lose their teeth. So dental flossing, use dental tape with fluoride. Uh, do that at least once a day, preferably before you go to bed because of the reduction in the saliva flow. Um, and as I mentioned, there's conflicting evidence, but there is support of using it generally and particularly um, as far as the periodontal disease is concerned. This is my first talk. Um, Mama, we're doing really well for time. So do you mind answering a couple of questions? We've just got a few questions about this initial talk. Is that all right? Of course. So the, the first one is um, the you mentioned a few times with facial trauma, 
to give antibiotics um, and what antibiotic would you recommend, what dose and how long for in that setting? Thank you. The, the bugs in the mouth has two uh, type of uh, bacteria, anaerobes and aerobes. So really uh, augmentin will cover both. So I will, if the patient is not allergic to penicillin, I will give augmentin. Uh, if they are uh, allergic to penicillin, I will use clindamycin. Okay. And how long would you normally prescribe? For one week. For one week, Correct. okay. Uh, and what size lip lacerations need suturing and suturing in children and adults? So we talked about obviously the big ones we refer on, the ones that clearly need suturing. What what size? What is the sort of minimum? This is this is an excellent question. Um, if it depends on the size of it. So if if for example if it's a laceration that involves the white line of of the let's say the lip, i.e. it cross between the red and white uh, and the skin. Mm. Mm. it's probably best to close that formally uh, because if you have a step and discrepancy between both really it's very unlikely that it will leave anxiety kind of feeling. Mm. Um, generally speaking if it's something more probably than five millimeter I will consider closure. Um, if it's usually quite often you get small kids with a cut in the gum from the inside between the, the we call the labia sulcus uh, this probably it will heal absolutely without without need of laceration, so you can get away with that. If it is involving muscle and is gaping, usually you will need formal closure. A glue will not really hold it, so um, it depends really on the size, the site of it, the cosmetic uh, impact, and whether there is a bone involved, etc. Yeah. Thank you, Mama. Um, and how do you number teeth is a question that's come through. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> okay. So uh, I will try to describe this in a webinar. I will use myself as a, um, uh, do we have, probably you might have some pictures. Um, yeah, okay, I'll use this one. So for adult, uh, the adult uh, person have uh, 32 teeth, uh, 16 in the top and 16 in the bottom, okay? And you start from the midline, okay? And it's, we use the American system here in New Zealand, um, and we start for dividing the, the mouth into quadrants. So we have the upper right quadrant, left quadrant, upper left quadrant, lower left quadrant, and lower right quadrant. And for some reason, it, it, you need to go through it in clockwise fashion, okay? So you can't say you go here and then you go down there. You need to go from the right, upper right, upper left, lower left and then go back to our lower right okay so for each quadrant you give a number so for the adult this will be one that's the first digit that would be two three four then you count each tooth in each quadrant so this is one tooth one that will be one one so that's tooth number 11. This means that the first digit on the left-hand side, the, the, it's, it's, it's the quadrant, which is the upper right quadrant, and the second digit indicates with what tooth. So if you have, let's say, one six, or let's say one, because I can't see here, let's say one four. One four will be one, two, three, four. So we know that it's one because it's in the upper right quadrant. One, two, three, four. That will be the first a premolar on the upper right, okay? So say I want to look at tooth um, uh, four, two. So you go four will be the lower right quadrant, which would be that, this one here, and that's the midline, four, two, one, two. That would be this tooth, which will be the lower right lateral incisor, okay? So this is for adults. For children, you, the same principle, but you continue with the numbering. So upper right will be five, upper left will be six, upper, sorry, lower left will be seven, and lower right will be eight, and the same. So you talk about central incisor in a baby on the top right will be five, one. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at the two here in the lower left-hand side, it will be seven, two, and so on. I hope that will explain. Thank you. That's a great explanation. A wonderful picture to do. On. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, let's keep on moving. We'll, uh, we'll keep answering these questions towards the end because I know you will cover a couple of the topics that have come up in, in this next bit, and then we'll go through some more questions. Thank you. Thank you. My, I hope you are still enjoying yourself and mm -hmm. uh, have a big bag of crisp or popcorn <laughs> to keep you going. 
So the next talk is really talking about just going through really important and common uh, oral conditions. Uh, and this is, this is the buccal mucosa of a patient with a white kind of striation. Uh, and we know this is it's quite, it's oral lichen planus. Probably most of us really seeing this uh, in patients' uh, mouth and they come and ask about things uh, related, related to that. It's relatively common. It's uh, chronic, persistent, immunologically mediated. It often affects women, uh, usually bilateral. Uh, it's always when you have patients asking about this, ask if they have any skin lesions. Uh, so because you can find also mucocutaneous presentation and they come with multiple subtypes, which I'll mention in a minute. The significance of lichen planus that it has a, a life a risk of malignant transformation of about one to 3%. And I've seen cases for patients who have this condition for about 10 years, 15 years, and they come with squamous cell carcinoma. So, because we have this kind of a lace reticular kind of pattern of white striation, it's called reticular oral lichen planus. This type has like white sheets, like plaques. It is a plaque type lichen planus. Easy. This one has kind of a red redness affecting the attached gingiva of the upper and lower teeth. Uh, it's erosive in, 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 in nature and it's called erosive lichen planus. And this type, you can see there's ulceration there, loss of the continuity of the epithelium, and this is obviously called ulcerative lichen planus. The significance of really remembering the subtypes is it stems from the fact that the erosive type and the ulcerative type are associated with a higher risk of malignant transformation. And as a result, they need probably a specialist to keep an eye on these patients. And these are examples of erosive and, uh, uh, and ulcerative types. So please, in these cases, try to rule out causes, usually drug um, hematinic deficiencies like vitamin B12, folate, uh, anemia. There is usually, you need to manage expectation. Usually there is no cure, but there is symptomatic treatment and also treatment that reduces the frequency of the symptoms. Uh, take a good photo, all of us, we have cameras um, and, 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 and sort of securely for record keeping and for monitoring. Um, these patients need an, a baseline incisional biopsy to rule out dysplasia. And if it is, is it, if it's not causing them any symptoms, just observe. Treatment starts with just either deflam, if it's really painful. If it's not painful, I wouldn't treat it. Diet avoidance, usually spicy, salty food. If, the, if you can persuade them to avoid that, it'll be great. You can escalate to dexamethasone mouthwash. I find the prednisolone uh, mouthwash, prednisolone is, is a lipid soluble. It's very difficult really to dissolve it, so probably you might be have better luck with the dexamethasone and they can use it uh, for about six months and then you gradually wean them off. You can use a capsaicin cream, uh, it comes at various um, strength uh, or you can escalate obviously to systemic steroid. I'm not expecting you to go into that so probably in your practice you can only apply topical treatment. If anything beyond that probably you need to refer the patient to either either an oral medicine specialist or maxillofacial surgery specialist. This is a lady, a young lady, came with a, a white patch. It's called lycoplechia, affecting the left lateral border ventral tongue. This a patient has an irregular red area affecting, again, the tongue. It is called erythroplechia, or red patch. And also, if you have white and red, you can have both. And this is erythrolycoplachia, a mix of both. Lycoplachias uh, are diagnosed by exclusion. You need to rule out a thrush, you need to rule out uh, a trauma, uh, friction. Usually they are painless and they are chronic. And pathognomic feature, uh, unlike candidiasis or thrush of the mouth, that if you put a piece of gauze around, wrap a piece of gauze around your finger and try to wipe it off, it doesn't come off. Rub it off, it doesn't come off. Um, as I said, this is spectrum. It can be white, red, or both. They are largely not human papilloma virus related. 
so patient I don't want them to become paranoid about uh, about that uh, and it can affect anywhere and can be of any size and there's a risk of malignant transformation of about three to five percent I put this in red because the vast majority of cancers of the oral cavity arise from a normally looking mucosa they do not come if you rely on the white patch or red patch or white and red patch to as a guidance whether this is a cancer or not you will miss a lot of cancers so please, the the vast majority will come just from a normal looking in mucosa this is uh, again white patch but it is different it has kind of a, a papillary form a surface rough surface is thickened and it's called proliferative verrucous leukoplakia pvl it's very rare. It, the, the association with HPV is still um, debatable. It usually affects large areas of the mouth in an elderly women. And the importance of that in PVL, the life risk of malignant tr transformation is quite high, 70 to 90%. It's unlike the normal leukoplakia. This, if any patient has this condition, they need to be really monitored very closely because there is risk of having cancer transformations very high. So management of oral patches, if not resolved within three weeks, you need to refer the patient. After removing the potential cause, you need to refer the patient to a maxillofacial surgery specialist. If it is mild dysplasia after the biopsy and the patient is low risk, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink heavily, they stick to follow-ups, they keep their appointment with dentists or with you every six months, etc., then you can observe. If they are high risk, they can't be bothered to turn up, they are heavy drinker, heavy smoker, probably you need to think about referring this patient for, for treatment. If it's anything more than mild dysplasia, then you need to think about excision. And the, usually I do that using laser and I use Logos iodine acetylcysteine to help me to distinguish between the normal looking mucosa and the abnormal looking mucosa. So this is just a quick diagram. I'm not going to go into the details. Once you take a biopsy, the pathologist will look at it. And this is really the important thing you need to look in the report, in the pathology report what degree of dysplasia if the abnormal cells the atypical cells affect the if you have the epithelial surface divided into thirds and this is the deepest surface uh, third if the abnormal cells affect the bottom or the basal third is called mild if the abnormal cells span the deep two third is called moderate and if it spans the full thickness of the epithelium is called severe if abnormal cells start to push the basement membrane without breaching it, like uh, sticking your fist through a curtain without making a hole in it, that's squamous cell carcinoma in situ. This is contained cancer. If the abnormal cells actually breach the basement membrane and invade deep tissue, it's a frank cancer or invasive SCC. So this is really just a quick uh, distinct, um, um, distinguish between various degrees of dysplasia. This is a clinical photograph, as you can see, with the non-raised, flat, uh, gray, light gray pigmentation of the gum with a missing tooth here. And this is consistent with amalgam tattoo. Uh, people don't need to pay to have amalgam tattoo, obviously. <laughs> they just need to have their, well, actually, they need to pay because they need to take their teeth out. So if you have dark gray pigmentation of the gingiva, uh, it's non-raised, smooth, smooth, as I mentioned, you really and, and the reason for that because the macrophages just eat the amalgam uh, fillings uh, the amalgam fragments and they get really stuck in the cells at cell level it usually doesn't really require any treatment it's not a melanoma if you are confident just assure the patient if not refer the patient to maxillofacial surgery specialist to review and confirm and most of them they will just be assured and discharged so this is again a white patch but if you again wrap your finger uh, with a piece of gauze and try to rub it off this will come off leaving a bleeding surface this is uh, usually typical of oral thrush it usually affect the soft palate uh, the posterior mouth the oropharynx in the back and this is uh, what we call uh, pseudomembranous candidiasis usually in the steroid inhalers uh, elderly people who are already dehydrated or malnourished uh, people who uh, wear uh, dentures with poor hygiene, diabetic patient, or those who've been using uh, long-term antibiotics or antibiotics for a long period of time. So take photograph, 
take a swab for microbiology and please don't wait if you think it's, it's trash just just start with with the um with the antifungal treatment and give patients prevent prevention advice so if it's uh, someone who uh, inhales steroids ask them to rinse them out after the inhalation and uh, someone with poor denture hygiene ask them to clean their denture and 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 most of them they even sleep with it so please ask them to take it off and keep it in a small pot in warm salty water uh, if it's diabetic, maybe aim for better diabetic control. So try to correct the underlying factors. And I listed down the, what, can, what you can use for uh, the treatment. The left slide, it is, uh, it is a depapillated. It's not really erythema. It is it's part of the normal tongue, but doesn't have papillae on it. And it, it looks like a rhomboid. And that's why it's called uh, median rhomboid glossitis. Median because in the midline, it's typical of that. And usually, really, it's uh, a, a variation of normal. Sometimes it can be associated with a candida infection. So really, if it's burning, if it's causing a bit of symptoms, it looks a bit whitish on the surface, it might be worthwhile giving a patient uh, two weeks of antifungal treatment. Uh, but don't be too upset if it doesn't go away, just reassure the patient. The one on the right hand side is geographic tongue or the fancy name is mig benign migratory glossitis and usually parents bring kids uh, with worried that oh gosh this, the, it's thrush there's something wrong but actually it's a normal variation um, or, or, or variation of normal just reassure them sometimes you can get zinc deficiency uh, but really in all my entire really career, probably I managed only to pick up one patient with zinc deficiency. You can screen for it if you want, but reassure the patient and discharge. No need for biopsies for either. This is typical uh, recurrent after stomatitis. Um, usually affect young people come in, in boats, multiple sites, and they heal without, without scarring. Um, usually they are painful recurrent affect uh, Teen, young adult, uh, they can be minor, different types, major herpetiforms. Rule out nutritional deficiencies, so you screen the patient for, for what I listed uh, for full blood count, uh, iron studies, folate and vitamin B12. Um, and really, it's symptomatic treatment. There is no really nothing to stop them uh, if there is no cause. And you just follow what, what I've just listed for oral lack and plainness. Uh, Deflam. Uh, dexamethasone uh, mouthwash. If anything needed more than that, you need to refer the patient. TMJ disorders, uh, we have um, five categories. Internal derangement, which is really clicking or looking. You have facial pain, myofacial pain, arthritis, joint fusion or ankylosis, and tumors, which are really rare. For TMG internal derangement, usually almost most of the time, they are young middle aged women, uh, painful joint clicking. There is always a stigma, um, a collection of other symptoms like uh, period irregularities, IBS, fibromyalgia, uh, clicking of the joint, and sometimes restricted mouth opening. And I, I'm not going to go through this, but uh, this is again explain the mechanics of, of, of the internal derangement. I use this template really, and I hope that you will find it useful uh, to actually diagnose um, and, and assist patient with TMJ problem. I get pain score. If it's normal, food score would be 10 out of 10. If it's abnormal, one out of 10. Do they have any grinding or clenching? This is parafunctional habits. Any history of arthritis, trauma, clicking, I measure the mouth opening because really I find it a very useful tool to monitor progress or uh, deterioration, wearing facets, um, and I will give at the end the work stage which we'll come to. So this again, someone who, who's heavy bruxer or tooth grinder, uh, you can see flattening of the teeth. This is typical of scalloping of the tongue, indication of uh, tongue thrusting, clenching habit. And I use Wilkes classification. Stage one, really, it's uh, someone who has painless click with normal mouth opening and usually reassure and discharge. A patient come with kind of a bit of uh, pain and locking, then you can consider soft diet, avoidance advice, massage, physio, bite spin, and non-steroidal, as I mentioned. 
if this is acute lock, consider arthrocentesis, and that's why I go for stage three and four. And if it's stage five, which is really very advanced arthritis, then you need to consider arthroplasty or joint replacement. So for Wilkes stage two, I mentioned steroids, and I'm not going to go through this again, uh, but uh, refer to a local dentist for further follow-up and bite splint. For Wilkes stage three and four, uh, again, non-steroidal, but have low threshold for arthrocentesis. And this is uh, a picture of arthrocentesis and arthroscopy, which you can actually have a look on the inside the joint and do the wash under direct vision. This service is available at Mercy um, Hospital in Epsom in our, uh, in our uh, service. TMG arthritis uh, usually affect, uh, manage it as any other joint arthritis. So if, if the patient has arthritis but normal mouth opening and no pain, just reassure, manage symptoms when deteriorate. But if the patient obviously has restricted mouth opening and severe pain, so you need to think and crepitus, you need to think about uh, joint uh, surgery. And this is typical, uh, a lady uh, I had referred with advanced uh, arthritis, not only of the joint, osteophytic changes, erosion, um, all the stigmata of, arth of arthritis is there. So this patient will need joint, um, and she's in pain, the mouth opening is poor, uh, then uh, they will need, she will need a joint replacement. So for advanced Wilkes stage five, as I said, TMG arthritis, consider arthroplasty and joint replacement. And this is a photograph showing bilateral TMG uh, replacement. Facial pain, I use uh, various things really. I start with medical treatment uh, and some patient, they, uh, they will get botulinum toxin injections. And these are the, the points where I inject the uh, botulinum toxin. So moving on now to another type of mucosal disease. This is really a, a, a cauliflower kind of papillary kind of growth on the soft palate. This is another kind of uh, papillary kind of growth on the just lateral to the lingual frenum. And this is squamous cell papilloma. It is almost exclusively a victory soft palate, um, oropharynx, um, the ventral tongue. And it's HPV related. Um, usually there is no risk of malignant trans transformation. Um, refer to a specialist with a view of uh, local excision. And usually they don't come back. And also please ask question if they have it elsewhere in their body, in the genitalia or on their fingers. This is uh, a, um, a gingival outgrowth. Um, basically, you have a part of the lesion sticking out in the labial aspect between 1-1 one, one and 2-1. And there's a, um, a connection between, between this growth and the one in the palate. And this is typical of pyogenic granuloma. This is another one affecting the buccal aspect of tooth 46 and 47. Okay, and this is the first more lower, lower right-hand side. I'm using the uh, uh, naming of the teeth just to give you some kind of exercise. So this is pyogenic granuloma, typical. Uh, it is an hourglass. You have a, a lesion in the buccal aspect, another lesion lingually, uh, and with the connection in the middle. Uh, usually associated with poor oral hygiene, hormonal changes, uh, especially during pregnancy. They bleed a lot. They can be really painful because they are really covered with a pyogenic membrane that doesn't really have a proper epithelium as such. So anything, brushing or anything, they will just make it bleed and usually needs excision. This is a young boy uh, who has a kind of this kind of blister on the ventral surface of the tongue. It's another one on the lip. And this is typical of mucosil, which is really a retention myelocyric gland cyst. Uh, Usually, if you have it, typical history, they will burst, they will refill again, and then so on. They are usually painless in young patient, and usually they need to excise the area of the affected gland. De-roofing it or taking the top surface will not really um, will not work. You need something to take the whole affected area and affecting gland out of, out. And I usually do that under microscopic magnification. 
This is different from the mucosil. It, if you feel it, it's not a blister, it is firm. Uh, it is not shiny or blue, it's pink and pale. It's another example here on the cheek. Again, pale, firm if you touch it. It's either pedunculated or sessile. This is we call fibroepithelial polyp. And usually the typical story, the patient was eating or talking, bit in his tongue or his cheek, and then get swollen, become more prone to be caught again, become bigger, and so on. And then they will come with this kind of fibrotic uh, um, tag covered with normal epithelium. It's benign and it needs local excision. This is a, a lobulated mass of the heart pellet. If you feel it, it's really bony. It usually crosses the midline and it is typical of torus palatinus. And this is developmental. It's not tumor. The patient needs to be reassured and discharged. This is a similar one, but is affecting the bottom jaw and usually the lingual aspect of the premolars and usually bilateral, symmetrical, lobulated, bony, covered with very thin uh, mucosa. And usually you just reassure the patient. But in this case, you can see that this is interfering with the oral hygiene. You can't clean it. Every time he is get this gets traumatized, so this needs to be removed. If it's small like this one, probably you can sit on it and do nothing. But if the patient were to have a, a denture or something, you need to smoothen this out and re remove it. So these patients need to be referred if they have symptoms and problem with that. So we talked about the torus palatinus, but I presented here another swelling in the palate. And let's talk about the difference between both. This one is actually, this one is not lobulated. It's one, one lump, one bulge. It looks yellowish. There's a bit, a bit of discharge here. If you press on it, it bounces, it fluctuates. And this is typical of the lateral incisor. The lateral incisor, the upper lateral incisor has its root points palatally. So the least path of resistance is the palatal side. So you get an abscess usually forming in the palatal side. This is a palatal abscess, not a torus palatinus. And obviously, once you touch it, the patient will jump and probably will not like you. And you will know the diagnosis straight away. And it could be also a cystic lesion as well. It's very unlikely to be salivary gland tumor because it's in the hard palate here in the front. And usually, there's no salivary glands. Uh, uh, salivary gland tumor, if you are going to have any, will be in the back. So again, we talked about the, um, the uh, torus mandibularis, a lobulated symmetrical mass here. And if you look here, you can see there's a subtle difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And when this patient had CT scan, there's a clear destruction of the lingual aspect of the mandible or, or the right side of the mandible. And that actually, after bone biopsy, came back as osteosarcoma of the mandible. So really, this is just a point to illustrate, really, please be observant, compare right with left, exactly in the same way you look at chest radiograph, compare right with left, and use your common sense. This is, again, it cannot be torus mandibularis, because really, it's unilateral, it's not really lobulated. If you press on it, it it's like an eggshell, um, and there is expansion here, and there's a bit of expansion down also here labially, that cannot be really a torus mandibularis. So scan showed a solid kind of a mass there, which is well circumscribed, OK? And after, after biopsy, that came back as an ameloblastoma, which is a, a very aggressive benign tumor of coming from the teeth origin. And you usually, you need to take it with a, with a margin. And this is the patient who had this resection with Alia Chris bony graft reconstruction, and this is him after the reconstruction. This is a small stone on the submandibular salivary gland duct orifice. And uh, the obstructive sialodenitis you, you may encounter can be either due to stone, which is the commonest cause, or it could be due to mucus plugging or a stricture. Uh, usually meal time swelling, painful swelling. Um, if it's infected, you may 
express pus when you press on the gland. Usually hydrate the patient, give them analgesia and uh, antibiotics and send the patient to uh, a maxillofacial surgery specialist. We have this uh, facilities at Mercy. Now we, we take these small stones with cylindroscope, 1.3 or 1.6 scope, and we can go all the way back to the hilum. And we can basically, with a basket, pull the stone out of the way and just take it out without the need of taking the gland out. This lady has a parotid mass. Again, you may encounter parotid mass, and she had pleomorphic adenoma. And this is the commonest benign tumor of the, of the parotid. Um, I refer the patient for further assessment and treatment. This is a picture of parotidectomy. It's going to become more bloody as we progress now. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> so this lady, uh, she was seen by various specialists and biopsy is taken and she was told there's nothing there. And she came really and I took a biopsy and came back as squamous cell carcinoma of the mandible. This is example of lady from Taronga, again, uh, tongue uh, cancer. It's a lady, again, from the North Shore with advanced cancer of the, of the maxilla. You can tell it looks angry, it looks nasty. You feel the teeth are very loose, usually painless. Um, it looks um, unhappy, as you can see. This is a gentleman who had a cancer, advanced cancer affecting the floor of the mouth, uh, basically, and the ventral tongue going all the way back to almost to the wisdom teeth and crossing the midline. This is floor of the mouth cancer. So please, the red flag sign, I know this is not common oral pathology, but it's really an important one. It should be unilateral, uh, single, you don't have multiple ulcers, a duration more than three weeks, usually painless. If you get the pain, it will be usually at advanced stage when there's an infection uh, and it's too late. It doesn't go away, unlike the recurrent after stomatitis. It increases in size, it doesn't shrink. Uh, patients will say, I have numbness of my lip if, if the mandible is involved or my tongue. The movement of the tongue, the speech will be affected if the movement of the hypoglossal nerve is invaded and, and, and the tongue is tethered. They will get commonly get earache and tongue cancer or tonsillar cancer. If you pass your finger and press on it, and it, uh, please don't only lock but also palpate, you will feel it's really hard, it's indurate, it's angry. If you pass your finger gently, it may start to bleed. We call it contact bleeding. It has rolled edges, necrotic, sloughy base. If it's close to the, if it's a guy with the floor of the mouth, he had obstruction of his submandibular salivary gland duct. So you'll have obstructive symptoms. Teeth will be become loose um, suddenly um, and change in the speech. So all of these really are red flag signs, and I hope you I hope it will help you really to distinguish which is which is a friendly ulcer, which one that you really need to worry about and refer. So then back to this lady, she had cancer that actually crawling all the way back to her second premolar, and she had. I'm sorry for the slide. She had resection of all her mandible from the angle to the angle, and she had fibula flap reconstruction. And this is the muscle from the leg to reconstruct flow of the mouth. Then this is the reconstruction with the fibula here, and she had two implants placed in each segment. And this is her after treatment, and she's going to have teeth in the next couple of weeks. Oh, wow. This lady, again, she had, her complaint was her teeth start to become loose. You can see the, the gum is angry, doesn't look healthy. You can see it here in the palate as well. CT scan shows almost two thirds of her maxilla being destroyed. This lady had complete transoral resection, no facial scars. Everything is done from inside the mouth of her top jaw and the part of the nose. So you are looking at the nasal septum here, the maxillary sinus on the left, maxillary sinus on the right, top view. And then she had a planning of reconstruction. She had implants placed, and this is her after the surgery, and she's going to have her teeth, hopefully, ex the implant exposed in the coming, at the end of uh, this month. So we are really not only 
the the fact that I'm coming from a dental background give me the advantage that I can actually take these cases all the way really hopefully to full rehabilitation and get them back to as normal uh, to lead as no, normal life as as much as possible. Finally, really, I'm coming to the end of my talk. Um, this is very important problem we encounter. This is a patient who's been put in bisphosphonate and a dentist decided to put implants. And as a result of that, the whole thing started to fall apart. This is bisphosphonate related osteonecrosis of the jaw. And what bisphosphonate does to all the bones in our skeletons that actually it inhibits the osteoclasts, minimize the turnover of the bone, uh, inhibits angiogenesis, impair the reparative activity or capacity of the bone. And as a result, the healing of the bone become compromised. So bisphosphonates is increase, increasing in its use. We expect to have a growing number of elderly uh, people in the country. So it's very likely that we are going to encounter this problem more and more commonly. So please, before you start or be part of the team starting the patient bisphosphonate, especially IV preparations, refer the patient to their dentist to have proper dental checkup, because managing these patients is really, really awful. So if for this patient, if I want to use the fibula flap, for example, uh, like this one, which was used in this lady, the fibula also will be affected with, with bisphosphonate. So really getting things to stick together is, 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 is going to be a big challenge. So please, just if, you, if you're starting, just let us know uh, and we can assist the patient. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Moama. That was wonderful, if not a bit gruesome. The last few pictures there, but they really um, show you the points that you were trying to get across. We've got a few questions, so are you happy to go through some of those now? Sure. Um, oh, one, someone asked if, if you have to do dentistry to become a maxillofacial surgeon. Yes, I did it the hard way, actually. <laughs> I, uh, I spent 14 years in formal university education, 14 years. Uh, three of them, my dad stopped talking to me because he felt that I'm wasting my life. <laughs> um, yes, the answer is uh, you in Western Europe, UK, you need to be doubly qualified, correct? Mm -hmm. So I have medical degree as well as dental degree. Now, uh, there's a few questions related around um, the TMJ dysfunction. One of them is, what can we do in the clicking phase that you get with TMJ dysfunction that can help prevent the um, progression to locking? Good question, really. Um, the, if, if the patient, you're talking about Wilkes stage one, which is really painless clicking with normal mouth opening, mm -hmm. really um, mainly reassurance um, lifestyle changes. And, and this really, if they are using a lot of chewing gum, you like uh, poorly cooked meat or uh, chewy steak, mm -hmm. really try to make them mindful of it. Um, if they are clenching their teeth, they are grinding their teeth, make them mindful of that. The teeth should be only really in contact 18 minutes during the day rather than 24 hours. Mm. Um, and bite splint. Uh, and that may break the, 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 the mechanism, uh, the feedback between, from the brain and the mus muscle of mastication. So this is a good question. So really lifestyle changes. Um, the natural history of the click in 70% of the patients, so reassure them, this is a very common problem. It happens in about 25, one in four, one in three, young people usually. And it's interesting that it burns itself out in 70% of the cases. So really, if you look at ladies, for example, in their 50s or 60s, you don't have this kind of TMJ problem a lot. So reassure them that hopefully it will burn itself out and just make them to be mindful of their problem, all right? and seek advice when things immediately, when, when things really, or, or soon when things deteriorate. Mm -hmm. The things to look for, the serious change is really painful clicking, sorry, painful restricted mouth opening and, and loss of click. All right, there's a, um, there's a question here around someone who's concerned about putting their fingers in someone's mouth to reduce an acute open lock. However, obviously if it's openly locked, they're not able to bite down on your fingers while it's open. When you reduce the lock, have you, do you, are you at risk of, of someone biting down your fingers or is it, does it all happen pretty quickly? Okay, I think really good, good question again. I think obviously you use your gloves. You don't need to pat your fingers, you'll be all right. <laughs> if you do it firmly with control movement, don't let it slip. So you are holding the jaw all the way while you are pushing it down and while you are seating it back into the, into, into the glenoid fossa. Where people get caught is once they disengage the articular eminence, the hump, 
they let things go and as a result they just get caught with their fingers and they get bitten mm -hmm. so please keep controlled movement in the disengagement as well as in by pushing the condyle back to 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 the uh, joint space wonderful and are tmj joint replacements available in the public system or are they only in private um that's again good question is okay if if it's um it depends if if the the public system is quite restricted in that mm. in that sense and most of the cases done in public system probably will be really through acc someone kicked by a cow or some hit through a sport injury then develop arthritis they will get funded through acc but then but, but the vast majority of the case will be done in private in in in, in new zealand uh do amalgam tattoos occur on the tongue um well very very unlikely uh, unless the dentist when he was taking the tooth out or the surgeon when he was taking the tooth out um, lacerated the tongue and you got something you need to have an open wound for the amalgam particles to go in and 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 get absorbed by the macrophage micro digested by the macrophages so very very unlikely and in um your geographic tongue if you rub it with a bit of gauze on your finger. We talked about thrush, where if you rub it, it, it comes off easily and it bleeds. Geographic tongue will not move. No, so no. it looks exactly the same. Correct. You rub it, it doesn't. Absolutely. Change. The yeah. reason why with that is really the, the the in the in the candida you have candida growth that will come off. The the, the, the film film will, will come off. Mm -hmm. While in geographic tongue, the areas of the is is the retinous area which has lack of the of papillae, so you don't have any artificial coating sitting on the surface of the tongue. So if you rub it, it's not going to mm -hmm. change. And does geographic tongue usually resolve spontaneously? No, so it's just reassure patients. This is absolutely normal uh, variation of normal. You don't need to worry about it. Don't look at your tongue. Don't take pictures <laughs> next to your tongue or your tongue sticking out. Just forget about it. So they're likely to have it for a lifetime. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Just chill out and enjoy life. <laughs> okay. Don't say that to the patient. <laughs> Um, if you were considering a biopsy for some of the plaque photos, if you were considering <coughs> a biopsy, would you do a, a punch biopsy and suture that, or how, how do you biopsy? Good. Providing, please, if you want to do that, take a photograph mm. first and take a photograph after you do the biopsy. My, I do not support, if you are not going to be treating these cases, do not do the biopsy. The reason for that is my concern. If it comes back with cancer, and it's a wide area and you don't need the surgeon will not need to take the whole area out but maybe part of it it is very useful to know where the biopsy was taken and 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 try to refer to it so if you have if you take photograph before and after that's absolutely fine i don't have any problem with taking with punch or just a, an ellipse with a scalpel and 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 please if it's a large area there's no harm of doing more than one biopsy we call it mapping biopsies so feel free if you feel that you actually i mean you're not going to take like 10 but if you are going to think like taking two or three that's absolutely appropriate but please if you want to do that take photograph before and after just in case if you ended up by referring the patient it's really very very helpful to try for the surgeon to try to to to, to refer back to where the, the lesion was Thank you. And would you consider, someone's asked, would you consider nice statin drops for oral thrush? Um, I don't. And the reason for that is because really you need something that hangs around for a little bit, uh, not something that you will swallow it quickly. I am very, I, 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 I'm very strong supporter of systemic um, antifungal treatment. Because you really, if you give like, let's say, fluconazole 50 milligrams once, once a day for two weeks, Patient compliance is better. You get it distributed everywhere. But the problem is, if a patient, if it's a, if a patient wears denture, so you need something topical as well. So if you have, if someone has a denture with a thrush, for example, you need probably something systemic, and as well as something like a statin gel to apply to the fitting surface, the, the surface of the denture that sits against the skin, load it, uh, paint it, and just let them let them put it in. But I wouldn't really uh, recommend drops. Okay. Uh, regarding a lot of good questions coming. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for staying yeah, awake with me. Yeah, We're going to go a little absolutely. bit further because there's yeah, a few absolutely. more here. Yeah, yeah. Um, recur regarding recurrent adverse ulcers, are there known dietary triggers for these? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and this is one of the things in the history taking. You need to ask if there's any kind of dietary connection to that. Yes. 
and also think about, for example, patients with celiac disease, Crohn's disease, you just need to, to, to ask questions if there's any bloody stool, mucus in the stool, mm -hmm. any, yeah. uh, so ask, yeah, is, is in the history taking, you need to, you need to rule out that uh, diet allergy. And I think you highlighted the deficiencies there, yes, didn't you, yeah, your iron yeah, and B12, yeah. yeah. Okay, should we refer everyone we start on bisphosphonates for osteoporosis um, for a dental checkup before uh, we start treatment? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, please. So that's a 100%. It's a good yes. take home tip yes. for, for everyone there. Please. Um, could you briefly discuss uh, about dental cysts? Good. What do you want me to start? <laughs> dental cyst. <laughs> dental cyst is, um, is, is, a, is a bag filled with a fluid. Um, and usually it affects the jawbone uh, and has to be in the jaw because um, that's why it's dental, because it, it, it originates from the embryological remnants of teeth. So if you have the most common one is really what we call dentigenous cyst, which is really associated with impacted teeth. And the most common impacted teeth will be really wisdom teeth or canine teeth. Um, and usually, and then you have, uh, if, if you have an infected tooth that has infection that gone down to the bone from the root down to the surrounding bone, you can get periapical cyst, which is inflammatory cyst. If you take the tooth out and you forget and you didn't examine or assist the patient, you have a cyst forming behind a tooth that was removed. It's called the residual cyst. You can also have a keratocystic odontogenic tumor. It used to be called in the past keratocyst. So yes, so the vast majority of them, they, they will look like the amyloblastoma case, which I described, will define radiolucent area. If it's associated with an impacted tooth, it's most likely to be dentigerous cyst, but you can't rule out unless you take, obviously, a biopsy. I hope that will help. Really. So your, your rule really in diagnosis, if it's really long, usually it is really painless, it expands buccally and lingually, um, I, I eat towards the cheek side and tongue side. If you press on it, it will bounce like an eggshell. It may have a bit of a blue, thin mucosal cover. The teeth may be really as well mobile in it. So yeah, it's all of these you just need to look, look, look and assess. Okay. Um, for rural practitioners, accessing maxillofacial services can be quite problematic. <laughs> Do you have any advice on access for rural New Zealanders? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I, I really, I mean, I think really hopefully when probably telemedicine become really a little bit more kind of commonly available, um, as I said, really, you have, I'm very happy, you have my contact mm -hmm. number. As far as I'm concerned, I'm very happy to help um, as much as I can uh, with advice. Um, and please feel free to do that. You have my contact there, email or phone. Um, but it's, it's, it's a problem. Uh, but the, the, the good thing I've, I, 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 I observed in New Zealand that actually patients are happy to travel. Mm. Um, I get patients from Palmerston or from the south, from various places. Um, and, and I hope that this kind of attitude will, will, will overcome and offset the, the challenges. But at the moment, really, I don't really have any kind of practical, mm. apart from maybe enhanced local skills at your at your practice um, in assessing dental and oral maxillofacial surgery problems, acquire some skills in splinting teeth if you want, or how to give local aesthetic inside the mouth. Feel comfortable of suturing inside the mouth, um, and basically find someone who's really able, uh, who's approachable to give advice until we have the technology and things in place. Oh, thank you. That's fantastic. That's a real problem in New Zealand, isn't it? I appreciate that. Um, a couple more. I think you talked briefly about this, but uh, someone's asked how you splint. How do you splint an avulsed tooth? And I think you talked about tinfoil and or a suture. Correct. Yeah. You really. I mean, you you are in a bad place. <laughs> well, not mentally, but physically, in terms of 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 having a patient walking in with an avulsed tooth, and the patient and the parents are so distressed about it. I can appreciate and feel for you. Um, I, I, I think because of the golden hour, if you are confident to give him a local to give the patient local anesthetic, give it good suction, good clean, and put the tooth back in. My advice to you really, if anything, if you don't have tin foil, the kitchen run out, whatever, if you don't have packaging for the switching material, you can use uh, um, non-absorbable sutures around, go, just go, go around, 
not the tube, but the, the, the adjacent teeth, just to create mm -hmm. a kind of a border to hold it. And maybe ask the patient just to bite in a piece of gauze and get to the closest dentist uh, um, available. If you don't have any of that, you just need to call the maxillofacial surgery on call, which they should have really 24 hour seven service. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how about draining? Well, thank you very much for trying to do that. <laughs> I, a lot of people respect you. <laughs> how about draining dental abscesses in primary care? Good. And again, for people really in the in in a remote geographic areas, I don't have any problem. Like if you can, if you are confident, and for example, the the last the first picture I presented of a localized gum boil abscess pointing to you, telling you please drain me, and you are happy to give an injection, numb the patient up just lance it um, and then send the patient afterwards for you you will do them a, a big favor by doing that because this will relieve a lot of their pain give them antibiotics mouthwash chlorhexidine 0.2 percent um uh, chlorhexidine gluconate 0.2 percent and just send them to the gp uh, to the dentist the following day but yes please if you if you are confident to do that go for it now, Moama, do you have an opinion on lip piercings and tongue piercings? Should we be advising our patients not to have them done? Yes. <laughs> there we go. The straightforward answer to Next. that one. Yes. <laughs> For both of them. <laughs> lip, lip and yes. tongue. Don't yes. do it. Um, okay. Well, and there's one here. What are the symptoms of OLP, uh, the symptoms of multiple lesions? Good. The OLP, it can be asymptomatic, not causing any problem, but, but the commonest um, a presentation would be really kind of uh, if the patient have symptoms the commonest uh, symptomatic uh, presentation would be burning when they eat spicy and salty food um, uh, in certain very small number they will get bleeding if it's really an assertive type um, but really mainly burning and soreness in the mouth yeah and and these cases as i said really if it's symptomatic you need to rule out the underlying cause avoidance advice and also treated with, with the topical measurement measures I, I've described earlier, mentioned earlier. And I think we've got here what with the bisphosphonates, someone's concerned about the, the dentist telling us not to use the bisphosphonates. Um, I think the refer, idea behind referring is to maximize the dental hygiene prior to using them, is that right? Yes, so really the uh, the, the discussion I have with patients, really, you need, you, we need to be honest, um, yeah. the, the patient are really like, patients who have severe osteoporosis, who are really at high and significant risk of, let's say, fracturing of spines or hips, and patients who had multiple myeloma, similar problems, or women with breast cancer and advanced breast disease, mm -hmm. cancer disease, you cannot say that you cannot be in bisphosphonate. So as long as the patient is well informed and making an informed decisions about the whole management of the bisphosphonate when it comes to teeth, but also when it comes to the reason why they want to be in bisphosphonate. I don't really have any strong feelings about it. I mean, I don't have any kind of things against against that, but they, the, the important message they need to make sure that there, if there's any rotten tooth or a tooth that has poor prognosis, it needs to be removed beforehand. Mm -hmm. If there's any infected tooth, anything dodgy that need to be sorted out before. These patients are, I find them, I inherited a cohort when I was a consultant in Manchester for about 12 patients with bisphosphonate problem. Their life is absolutely miserable. And really, if we can reduce the complication, if, the, if there is a strong indication for, for putting them on bisphosphonate, absolutely go for it. And my advice to consider give priority for oral preparation because they are associated with a, a lower risk of joint necrosis, then in oral preparation should be given a priority. Mm -hmm. But if there is no, if the risk is too high, then and, and the IV preparation infusion will be the only choice, then they have to, to have it. But providing that their teeth are absolutely spot on before, before they start. Okay. And one last question here, does repetitive behavioral biting the inside of your mouth, does that increase your risk of oral cancer? Uh, a trauma is one of, one of the uh, chronic trauma is one of the uh, etiological factor in, in in oral cancer, but it is very 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 small factor. It's a very small player in the whole. The main cause of oral cancer, not oropharyngeal or tonsillar cancer, the difference. But oral, if you are talking about oral cancer, i.e. anything in front of the soft palate, down to the inner part of your lip, this oral cavity, 
tobacco smoking and alcohol drinking. Yeah. These are the things you need to focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have, God forbid, if you have cancer because you keep biting your cheek, it's probably due to other reasons and a bit of bad luck rather than because of you biting your cheek. Mm -hmm. Look, thank you, Mama, and thank you, everyone, for hanging in there for those last few questions. I think um, everyone's been really engaged with such an interesting talk. And all these slides and Mama's um, presentation will be on our website from tomorrow. We'll send you a link on email. Uh, so if you want to go back through um, and have a look at some of those wonderful pictures again, then you can do that. Thank don't, you once again. Don't, don't do it tonight because no. you might have bad dreams. But thank you so much for uh, hanging around, and I really enjoyed talking to all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Me. Good night.